thank you to everyone who's joining. Thank you very much. We're just going to let sort of everybody come in and and um, and then we'll get started in a, in a few moments. Okay, thank you very much to everybody who's joined. Um, there's still a few people who are joining, but I think the, um, the most people who, who have joined are already in, so we can go ahead and get started. My name is James Berry, and I'm here to do um, a, sort of an, an, an addition to the Healy ALS platform trial webinars, which is the monthly EAP update. Um, Dr. Babu gave this update last month, and, and I'll be giving it today. Um, and Dr. Sokovich is also here um, representing the platform trial and, and we'll work together on the question and answer session after the, the formal presentation. So thank you for being here uh, with that next slide. So today I'm gonna to talk about um, three expanded access programs that, that we're leading through the Healy Center. Um, I'm one of the principal investigators along with uh, Dr. Suma Babu and Dr. Sabrina Paganoni, and we are really thrilled to be able to, to bring these uh, projects and um, you know, enact what we've been looking forward to for many years, which is uh, a multi-center, concerted, expanded access program um, that really allows more people with ALS to be involved in experimental therapies and have access to investigational products. Next slide. So this really started with Act for ALS. Um, the Act for ALS was signed into law December 23rd, 2021, so almost exactly two years ago now. And it really created a new opportunity to fund and run expanded access programs and collect real world data and do that in parallel to clinical trials um, using this expanded access program mechanism that I'll talk about in, in, in just a minute. But, but the, the law really set out that these were grants um, to do research on therapies using these, what we call intermediate size expanded access programs. That is more than one center, uh, more than one participant. And the idea was to create you know, larger expanded access programs, um, make those accessible across the country. Um, and and the, the funding was given to the NIH to hand out as a grant mechanism so that investigators and companies could come together, write a grant for a good idea for an expanded access program stipulating that this would be alongside a trial, a, a, a clinical development program that is alongside trials. Next slide. So just to give a, a little bit more definition around expanded access protocol, um, what this is, is a, it's a pathway for people with serious illnesses to access investigational products. That's study medications, study devices, study you know, something that we're studying outside of clinical trials when there aren't other satisfactory therapies available. Um, and so ALS really fits into this definition as something where we have treatments, we'd like to do better, it's certainly a serious illness, um, and we have investigational products that are being tested, but there are people who are excluded from those studies or those trials. And this expanded access protocols, and this is really important, focuses on people who don't qualify for our, for our clinical trials. So the idea is not to substitute this for a trial, but to run it alongside so that more people can have access to these investigational products. Next slide. Now, the FDA actually encourages expanded access programs when drugs are being developed in ALS. And they really encourage this by pointing out two potential benefits. One is to gather long-term safety data. So expanded access programs can run for varying amounts of time, depending on the program, depending on what's known about the safety and, uh, of the investigational product, where it is in development. Um, but they can give us long-term safety data and not only that, but they can do that in a, popul in, in a new population of people. So people with uh, disease that, that doesn't fit whatever the criteria are for the, the trial that's going on. When we move from doing a trial to a drug working in that trial and being approved, we're often moving from a population that's very selected to be in a trial to kind of everybody with the disease. And by, by running expanded access programs, we can actually 
get some early data on how people who didn't fit in that trial will respond. Are there different adverse events? Are there different effects? Is there more of an effect? Is there, uh, you know, are there different things we should look for or at different frequencies? And so it's really an opportunity. Um, and in order to do that, we have to not just provide access to, a, to an investigational product, but also do some study alongside that study of safety, that is, you know, gathering side effects, uh, gathering safety labs, uh, as well as, you know, information about efficacy and, and or effectiveness. And that means, you know, our, our tried and true vital capacity and um, ALS functional rating scale and, and other outcome measures. Next slide. But, and I should say biomarkers as well. So I'm going to talk about three programs. The first one I'll talk about is an expanded access program of Trehalose. Trehalose is regimen E in the platform trial. Uh, and this is a study that's already, uh, or a program that's already going. Next slide. So the planned enrollment for the Trehalose Expanded Access Program was 70 uh, people with ALS uh, um, participating at up to 25 sites. Um, it's weekly intravenous infusions of Trehalose, 90.5 milligrams per milliliter at a dose of 0.75 grams per kilogram. The key thing here is that this is the dose that's being tested in the, in the platform trial. Infusions can take place at the study center or at home. In general, if it's the first time that people are um, exposed to the, to the investigational product, um, they have to do three infusions at the study center and then can be uh, transitioned to home. If they've already been exposed to it, then they, they can begin at home. We, we thought of sort of two cohorts here uh, or two group participating groups. Cohort one is people who've never had trehalose before. They don't qualify for another trial. Um, they haven't been in uh, the trial of Trehalose. That's cohort one. And cohort two is people who completed regimen E of the Healy platform trial and aren't eligible uh, to, to enroll in, in the platform trial again at the end of their, of their participation. So they've already been exposed to, to uh, Trehalose. Next slide. So this was the first expanded access program that was awarded through uh, Act for ALS through the NIH. Um, startup happened uh, in the fourth quarter of 2022, that is the last three months of 2022 and into the first three months of 2023. Um, and that, that startup period is really a process of identifying the sites that will participate, finalizing the protocol, getting the ethics board or IRB approval of the protocol, um, designing all of the safety monitoring that has to happen, putting those, you know, all, all of those vendors in place, sort of um, putting all of our endpoint training in place, really getting all of the study teams at all of the sites ready to do the trial, getting the protocol in shape. And then we begin enrollment. And that started um, at the end of the first quarter of 2023 and continues to this time, but, but we'll, we'll talk in just a minute about how we're getting close. Treatment follow-up then continues from the the last patient in until that last patient into the study has completed um, six months of, of, of treatment. And then we close out and report on our findings. Um, we have at this point, 20 of our 25 sites that are activated and 58 of our 70 planned enrollees um, in the study. So cohort one has had 41 participants enrolled and cohort two, that is people rolling over from the, the platform trial has 17 participants enrolled. We have three participants in screening or scheduled right now. So that brings us to within nine of our planned enrollment. This is um, on track or ahead of uh, or ahead of schedule, which is a really, really a, a, an amazing place to be uh, for, a, for a study. Next slide. So these are the study sites. You can see spread across the, the nation. The idea was to have geographic, uh, sort of uh, expansive geographic access uh, for people with ALS. Um, and you know, we're very thankful for, for each of these sites and all of the participants that are, that, are, that are at each of these sites for the study. Next slide. So I want to talk about two additional NIH-funded EAPs that are going to be, start their enrollment by spring 2024. The first one is an expanded access of a drug called prodopidine, and that prodopidine is, was tested in regimen D of the platform trial. And then, I, and then I'll turn my attention to an expanded access protocol of 
um, a product called RAPA 501, which is actually not a drug, but rather a cell therapy. And it's what's called an autologous cell therapy or cells from uh, the participant themselves. And I'll go into that in a little more detail. Next slide. So we're currently in the startup phase for these. Um, and what that means is, as I said before, we're finalizing training, contracts, um, our local agreements, um, our labs, finalizing protocols, getting ethics board sign off, designing our data capture systems, um, you know, working closely with vendors um, and, and really sort of making sure that we have all our T's crossed and I's dotted um, as we go into the enrollment phase for these studies. So there's a lot of work to be done and, and we're excited to be, um, you know, really well into this startup phase for these expanded access programs. Next slide. So uh, um, we'll talk first about Perdopidine. I should say this is called Perdopidine. You might not have noticed it's called Perdopidine EAP2 <laughs> because there was an, an expanded access program that ran uh, alongside the, the uh, platform trial as well. Um, this is a much bigger uh, expanded access program, really a great opportunity with this funding. So there are 45 sites that will be participating in, in this expanded access program, again, to try to get broad coverage and get a site near as many people as possible. Our target enrollment is 200 people with ALS who do not qualify for clinical trials at, at the enrolling site and have established care at a specialized ALS center. The, the dosing for this and, and the formulation is the same. So it's an oral drug, it's 45 milligrams, and it's taken twice a day. So really the same as what was tested in, in uh, Regimen D. Next slide. So perdopidine is what's called a sigma-1 receptor agonist. And the sig what that means is it activates the sigma-1 receptor. And when the sigma-1 receptor is activated, it, has, um, it reduces cellular stress it reduces cellular inflammation, and it enhances the ability of the cell to clear out toxic proteins, misfolded proteins, kind of garbage proteins. It helps the cell get rid of those, break them down. It helps then the cell produce energy more efficiently. It, the cell does that through transferring ions across membranes. It helps with connectivity of the neurons um, and is essentially protective to the neurons. So that's what we see in the, in the and the science that led to this coming into a trial. And that's why we're excited about this uh, being in a trial and, and coming to expanded access. Now we have data from the Healy ALS platform trial, uh, Regimen D, that demonstrated that it was safe and well tolerated. It did not meet its primary and secondary endpoints in the platform trial, but it did show a benefit in slowing bulbar and speech decline. And these are newer outcome measures in trials, although we have been, we've been really researching them for more than 10 years in ALS in a very concerted way. And actually they have been used successfully uh, in trials uh, of uh, Nudexta in the past. So we have a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of faith in these uh, um, outcome measures where we can make a recording and look at how, how, how quickly people are speaking, uh, how good their articulation is and how that changes over time. And that favored the, the um, perdopidine in, in the trial over placebo. Next slide. Yeah, okay. So so that's so that's perdopidine. We I, we can answer questions about that. I thought we had one more, but um, and and what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the RAPA five hundred one expanded access program, um, and uh, and how that one's set up too. So next slide. So RAPA five hundred one is. Uh, um, it's a cell therapy. I told you it was an autologous cell therapy. It's a regulatory T cell therapy. So what this means is that the participant, a participant who wants to be in, in the expanded access program would come in for a screening. And if they enroll in the trial, their first visit would be to have something called apheresis. Apheresis is a way of taking blood out of the, you know, through a vein, to take the blood out through an IV put it into a machine that processes the blood very quickly, keeps the white blood cells, those are the immune cells. So it keeps some of the white blood cells and puts everything else back into the body. So we're just filtering out some of the white cells. Those white cells are the immune cells. When we've captured enough of those, we send that, we, we stop the procedure and then we send that those white cells down to the company where they can be sorted out 
and the company finds the regulatory T cells in them. Those I'll, I'll show you on the next slide about those regulatory T cells, but those are, those are the good cells that reduce inflammation. And the company then grows those cells in rapamycin. Rapamycin is actually toxic to T cells. It's a bad thing for T cells. So what, what happens is only the strongest T, regulatory T cells survive. So what we, what we end up with is what are called naive, very robust regulatory T cells. Those are then grown and expanded and frozen. And they're frozen into four batches, up to four batches, which are sent back to the site. And the participant would then come in every six weeks to have up to four IV inf intravenous infusions of their own very strong, naive regulatory T cells, which will quiet inflammation. We know in ALS that inflammation uh, is increased and regulatory T cells are decreased. So that's why we're doing this. I explain all that on this slide to say, here, we're only looking for 40 people with ALS to participate and only doing that at 10 sites. This, these, are, these are specialized procedures. Um, they're expensive, uh, they're very detailed. Um, and so we're, you know, it's a smaller study than, than the one that you heard about before. We're enrolling people who don't qualify for clinical trials at the enrolling site, who have established care and who have a vital capacity less than 50% of, of predicted. And the reason for that is that in the trial thus far of, of RAPA 501, we enrolled people who had a vital capacity over 50%. So in order to number one, not interfere with that trial, but number two, really expand this to a new population. We're looking for people who have a vital capacity under 50% of, of predicted. Next slide. So this shows you a pictorial, a little bit of how this works. So the RAPA501 cells, again, they're the person's own cells. They've been you know, taken out, grown, put through the gauntlet, and these special regulatory T cells that are anti-inflammatory are put back into the body. What they do is they quiet inflammation by stopping the killer T cells or pathogenic T cells from attacking the, the motor neurons. So they, they sort of take And uh, we'll be measuring many biomarkers in blood uh, in this study. We'll also be measuring ALSFRSR, vital capacity, and a number of, uh, of uh, digital outcome measures as well. So we want to we want to get as much information as we can about how this is working uh, in this you know in this new population as well. We're really excited about this as well. I think that's the last slide uh, here. So next slide. So you can find additional information generally on expanded access programs at the FDA. There's uh, information about expanded access programs in, in ALS on the Northeast ALS uh, Consortium or NEALS Consortium website. You can find information about our EAPs on the Healy and AMG Center for ALS website. That page is just being constructed as we get as we're in the startup phase. So, um, you know, if you if you go there and you're you're finding that it's either you know not complete or 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 down at the time you go there, please understand that we're building this as we build the trials out as well. Next slide. Okay, that's it. So we can move to the question and answer um, session. Yeah, thank you, uh, James. Um, yeah, please, people, uh, put in any questions that you might have. Uh, there's one question in there which is uh, more related to the um, platform trial when the trihelos trial results, uh, if we know the outcomes. And I, I might just answer that we we don't have the outcomes of that trial yet. It remains blinded, and uh, when we do, we will um, share the news uh, with the participants in the trial and then with the broader community. And I don't see any other questions, but let's give it uh, some time if people want to uh, type in any questions they might have. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So there's a question of how will regimen E results affect the red, uh, the CELOS EAP? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we've been excited to be running this trial alongside the, the platform trial, regimen E of the platform trial. As the results for regimen E of the platform trial come out, they could have some impact on, on um, the expanded access program. Um, the, most times, <laughs> trial results are fairly nuanced. 
Um, and so we wanna be sure that we take enough time to look at those nuanced results and, and make the right decision for what uh, for what should happen to the to the study. I think there are a couple of a couple of very obvious answers. If we were to ever see that uh, this that that regimen E was harmful to people compared to placebo, then the expanded access program would stop. Um, and we would do that as quickly as we could because we don't want to do things that are harmful to people. The chances of that are very, very slim given uh, given the structure of the platform trial. Um, but you know that's a that would be a black and white answer. If the top line result is positive and the secondaries are positive and it looks like there's really a robust effect here, I think there's a very obvious answer that this would continue. And then uh, uh, I think you know the, the real question is how do we expand it and what are the opportunities there? And, and that's something we would explore right away as well. Then there's a lot of gray area in between and it's hard to say exactly what, what would happen because there's so many ways that the results can come out. Thank you. Um, this, another question, it's great to have periodic focus on EAPs. That's great feedback. What are the duration of EAPs? So diff, so that's a great question too. So different EAPs can actually be structured in, a, in, in various ways. So um, EAPs in general, there's no, there's no sort of one definition that says an EAP has to run, you know, X, Y, Z duration. Um, the RAPA, the, the RAPA 501 EAP, will run um, until people have had up to four in infusion of, of, of their own cells at six month intervals. Um, so a little bit longer than six months because there's a screening period as well. Now, because of the manufacturing process, because cell therapy is a little bit unpredictable, we may not be able to manufacture for uh, enough cells for four infusions for each person. So that's why, that's why I've said up to, we hope we'll get there for everybody, but it may be that people only participate until they're, they're, the cells that we've been able to produce are gone. For the predopidine, for the predopidine um, we'll be running that one for, um, I believe it's a year, although I, have to, I don't have it in front of me, so I'll have to just double check that. And then for the trehalose, we'll go until six months after the last participant uh, enrolls. Unless, you know, unless there's a change for me. This uh, question about whether you can comment on the CN CNMAU8 EAP or the clean nanomedicine EAP. Yeah, so so um, the CNMAU8, so CNMAU8 was regimen C in the platform trial, um, and they began uh, their, uh, uh, um, an EAP funded through the company, which is ongoing now, and they were also awarded an EAP grant, um, and we'll have... I think we'll have Jinsey Anders, who's the PI of that, come and talk on one of these webinars as well. Um, um, so they've also been, been awarded an NIH grant to extend and expand that expanded access program. And I, what I'll say is that they're, they're also in the startup phase. Now, it's a little different because they have an ongoing EAP, and that's enrolling now. Um, and then they, they're expanding that with the, with the NIH funding. But the, they're in the startup phase for that um, um, for that expanded NIH. And, and uh, Catherine just put the link to that EAP also um, uh, in the in the um, in the chat. Um, so the, the question is whether the RAPA five hundred one is the medicine or mechanism action similar to the Koya trial. So um, there's a sort of a complex answer to that. So so um, these are these are. Um, Regulatory T cells or T regs, as we call them for short, um, uh, we ran we we ran a trial along with um, Dr. Pell at Methodist that also looked at regulatory T cells. There are differences between that trial and the RAPA uh, trial in how those cells are produced, um, as well as in what other therapies we gave alongside them. So in the in the trial that we did with Dr. Pell. Um, we didn't put the cells through as rigorous a growing environment, and um, and so there's a, there's some chance that when we put the cells back into the body, they can they can switch from the regulatory T cells, who are the good guys, to killer T cells, who are the bad guys. And in order to prevent that, we treated people with uh, alongside the regulatory T cells, we treated with a drug called IL two. Um, because of the way the cells are produced in RAPA 501, 
we don't need to treat with um, IL-2 to protect them because they, they're they tough. They stay as, as regulatory T cells. So there, there are some, some real differences, but um, very similar approaches. So a question about whether there's any exclusionary items in EAPs, such as accepting supplements, et cetera. So we really try to make these as broad as we can for people to participate. Um, anything that it be, that becomes a potential safety concern, we do have to create exclusion criteria for. Otherwise, we really try to leave it as broad as we can. If it, I should say, participating in two expanded access programs at the same time is typically not um, not permitted for this kind of expanded access program. Good. There's a couple questions. I don't know if they're from the same person or different people around um, the timing of the. Uh, tree helos uh, results from the platform trial. And we don't have that information right now to share. But um, as with all our other studies, uh, when we have the results, um, uh, we do a, a public uh, relations uh, um, a brief you know, comment about it. And we we schedule a webinar with the participants first, and then we'll bring it to this and other, other, uh, other groups to share the results. And so I, I just the question, add. I think, is uh, what are the primary, what? I just, I just, I want to add to that, that, you know, that, that you, you know, under your leadership, really, there's been a lot of thought about trying to get results as quickly as possible. And that, you know, that's done in conjunction with, um, you know, patient advisory boards and community advisory boards to, to really think this through, because we know that people are waiting for this. And, and you, you've, you've just set such a good example for that. I just wanted to you know, you. let people know that. It's hard for you to say that. <laughs> what are the primary and secondary outcomes for the RAPA trial? That'll be our last question. Yeah, so so I, um, I, I want to be very clear about these expanded access programs because they 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 occupy a, a, a real niche space. Expanded access program in general spans this gamut from you just give an investigational product to people um, and you know, just keep an eye on their safety and really don't gather any information about how they're doing or what the effect of the drug is, other than you know, making sure that you you know that people are safe. All the way up to a, an expanded access program that really has scientific questions and is trying to help with the development of that drug. And we're really in that second category with all of these expanded access programs that I've talked about. Having said that. The primary aim of them all is to provide investigational product to people who wouldn't otherwise qualify for, for getting access to these expanded access programs. So um, for each of them, we are kind of also, in addition to providing access, in addition to gathering uh, safety and tolerability information in this, in, in this new population, um, those are really our, kind of our primary goals, but we're also trying to understand whether there's a, a, an effect on, on how people do. We can't do that in our traditional way of putting some people on the drug and some people on placebo. That's not a part of expanded access programs. Everybody gets access to these. What we are trying to do in, in each of these is follow how people are doing, look at biomarkers like neurofilament, um, compare to natural history studies, um, looking at ALS FRSR or, or, and or uh, vital capacity um, and and. Uh, and survival as well. So all of those are kind of um, important outcomes to us, but really the primary and secondary endpoints are giving people access and looking at safety and tolerability. So we are at 5.30. Uh, there are two more questions. Um, James, I don't know if you can see them. I actually have to drop off for another call, but maybe you could answer those two questions. Sure. Um, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, there's there's one question about our biomarker results ever shared uh, with participants in, in the studies. And um, the, in general, the answer is that they are not shared with participants, uh, whereas safety labs are shared with participants. And the reason is that often biomarkers that we're looking at, we don't know so much about how they perform. Um, and they're generally research labs, not clinical labs. And so that that sort of limits how we share them. Um, I will tell you that neurofilament occupies a gray area here. It's it's It has not been available clinically until more recently. Um, and so we generally have not shared back neurofilament. Um, that may change over time. What has not changed about neurofilament is that 
in most studies, it has to be measured um, at the end of the trial as a batch. So that's one reason that we, we for now, are not going to be sharing it back. The other thing that's tricky about neurofilament is that it is often an outcome in, in the trial and potentially, we hope, could be unblinding. Um, that is to say, if people saw their neurofilament going down by a dramatic amount, they might know that they were on the drug if that if that drug or investigational product is um, effective. And so we have to be really thoughtful about neurofilament. And, and I think that's an area we're talking about a lot. But in general, we try not to share trends on the actual outcome of, of, the, of the trial. But uh, it's complex, and, and I'll just acknowledge that. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just, give me just one second to, to read. Um, is the predopidine clinical trial still open? And if not, could uh, could someone qualify for the EAP? So the predopidine clinical trial um, has completed. We have results from that, uh, from that trial um, that we talked about. It did not meet its primary or secondary endpoint, but it did have some positive results that were encouraging and uh, really led to us doing this EAP and continued development of, of the drug. So the expanded access program will be enrolling um, in the spring. Um, and then uh, will there be a regimen H or I for the platform trial? And the answer is there will be regimens H and I and, uh, and J and K and L. And, um, and hopefully at some point we will then uh, have the, the definitive treatment and, and that's when we'll stop. Um, uh, timing on those, I, is, I, I don't know exactly. I think that's, I think that comes, brings us to the end of the Q&A, at least that I see. Um, thank you to everybody for joining. Uh, this is, re it's really nice to have a chance to kind of get questions, talk about these EAPs. We're incredibly excited to be able to do this. This is something that we've been thinking about, aiming for hoping for for a very long time. So we're we're just thrilled to be able to to bring these uh, these EAPs to fruition. Thank you for joining. Thank you. See you next week. Bye bye.